Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another new session of Tech Athena. For those of you who are uh, visiting for the first time, Tech Athena is a platform where we discuss about new and upcoming technologies which are going to change your data center or the way you are going to work. Uh, today with us uh, is my co-host Shalaka and uh, Gaurav, our speaker. Hey, so, hi, uh, Tech Athena. Uh, thank you for joining in uh, on a weekend for this session. Um, I'm a co-host on Tech Athena with Dipti and let me introduce uh, Gaurav. Gaurav is part of the IBM uh, engineering team. He works with uh, projects which need specialized attention in AI MLDA. Uh, recently, Gaurav published a paper on uh, impact and defenses of uh, adversarial effect uh, attacks in the uh, image uh classification and recognition now this is a topic that uh, may not be very um, on our face at this moment uh, though it is uh, almost at the bleeding edge because of the all pervasive uh, inclusion that ai is uh, ai is making and making the inroads into the decision making that is going to impact all of our lives um, th there may be certain ways in which you know you can really manipulate the results or the understanding of the images that AI infers and, and to that extent uh, really keep uh, a big gap in terms of whether it will aid us making the correct decisions or not. Gaurav is going to speak about uh, some of the techniques that uh, the attackers might use, um, how that impacts and maybe some of the defenses uh, that we can put up uh, to safeguard us. Over to you Gaurav. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. And uh, thanks to Tech Athena for uh, giving me the opportunity to share uh, some of my findings and uh, observations with you. So I hope my screen is now visible. I'll go into sideshow mode. All right. All right, so sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I'll cover adversarial attacks on AI, uh, their impact and uh, defenses. So uh, this is the outline. Um, introduction, uh, I'll introduce what adversarial attacks are, motivation of why we should care about them. And uh, I'll also cover the approach presented in our paper along with uh, the existing other approaches that are uh, there in the literature. And then I'll walk you through some results, uh, show you what to expect from a typical defense mechanism point of view, and what are the conclusions, what are the takeaways for us. So just a quick overview uh, if somebody is relatively new to the field, right? So what is deep learning? So traditionally, machine learning involves around, you know, taking some input, doing some feature extraction, and uh, that can be done manually, that can be done by handcrafted features, uh, such as SIF, FOG. These are all features that have been used in computer vision. Uh, the idea is that they take the pixels and they perform a set of predefined uh, tasks on the pixels. Um, and then you use some sort of classification and this is where neural networks were used earlier and other stuff like uh, k nearest neighbor classifier or svn and then you get the output let's say you're doing a car detection model so the output will be car or not car deep learning essentially combines feature extraction and classification in such a way that the neural network does the feature extraction and the neural network does the classification for you as well so all you really need to do is have large amounts of labeled data and just give it, okay, this is the input, this is the output. You figure out how to get from input to output and the deep learning model will do that for you. So the building block of a deep learning uh, network is essentially just a neural network. And this is the kind of operation that happens. So X1, X2, X3, these are all elements of your input vector. So if your input vector is X, it has three dimensions and you will have X1, X2, and X3. And it would get multiplied by your weights. And every layer of a neural network has a certain set of weights, depending on what the size of input there is. And it gets uh, passed through an activation function that is to introduce some non-linearity in the system. A typical choice of activation function would be sort of, you know, sigmoid family of functions. And you would get the output by. Now this output acts as input to the next layer of the neural network. And that is how the neural network becomes deeper and deeper. So a simple neural network on the left-hand side, the red layer on the very left 
uh, represents the input. Then you have a hidden layer, and then the blue nodes represent the final output of the network. These blue nodes might be, you know, the same as the number of classes. So if car and not car, you would have two outputs, and the greater the value of the output node, that is the output that the network is giving to you. In case of a deep learning neural network, you add more and more hidden layers. So all of these hidden layers are essentially the output of the layer is not visible to you directly. You uh, give the input, um, all of these operations, right, X into W, plus some bias. This happens uh, within the network and you get the output. So how does the network learn how to map the input to the output? Uh, what happens is that you initialize all of the weights to some random value or using some pre-training. And then you say that, okay, this is the output I'm getting right now, let's say Y cap. And I know that the actual output should have been Y. And uh, you know that's the ground truth, that's the label. You take, take the difference between Y cap and Y, that is the difference between the expected outcome and the actual outcome you got. And you have an, a sort of an error claim. And what you try to do is you try to take the gradient and try to descend on this error plane and try to get to the global cost minimum. Essentially, the point where your error is the minimum. And each in every step, you're taking this gradient and you are changing all of the weights of the network. And this was traditionally done using a system called backpropagation. Um, and that's how you essentially backpropagate the error and change each weight according to the in, uh, extent that it influences the final outcome. So if some weight has influenced this incorrect outcome more, then we change it more, right? Makes sense. And this is the all the mathematics, but what is the interpretation of how does a network learn? So for uh, quite some time, this was a mystery, but now more and more research is being done to you know try to unravel this and try to understand what the network learns uh, internally. So in the case of a face recognition or a emotion recognition or any layer right, that takes faces as input, this is what we traditionally observe. So the input layer is of course your face, the output layer is you know, some attributes of the face, whether it be identity or gender or emotion or all of those things. The very first layers learn very simple features, patterns of local contrast. Uh, the next few set of uh, layers would learn face specific features. Sorry, something like you know eyes, a certain type of nose, a certain type of arrangement. In case of emotion, it could be a certain type of shape of your lips, all those things. And eventually, the very last layers learn uh, very very specific face features. So as the network goes deeper, the features get more and more specific. And finally, you get the output. And uh, deep learning is everywhere. Uh, and the reason that today's talk is relevant is because you know if there is something that can sacrifice or essentially sorry compromise the safety or security of your deep networks, then that's uh, you know a big challenge because it's being used in automotive and transportation, autonomous driving, um, accident avoidance, all of the self navigation systems. And then uh, security and public safety, you know, automated surveillance where it would, you know, keep monitoring a particular area using CCTV. And when any individual who is on a particular blacklist or watch list enters the area, that would flag it. Uh, in case of healthcare, cancer, like IBM has, uh, in fact, deployed some solutions and other companies are working as well uh, in this area heavily. Um, and then broadcast media and entertainment. So you might have seen a feature called X-ray in Amazon Prime Video if you use it. And, and essentially what that feature is that you are streaming a particular show or a movie. And if you pause and you click on X-ray, it will tell you which actors are present uh, on that screen. It will tell you the character, the actor. If you click on that actor, it will take you to the page or something. Um, and auto captioning, right? So uh, not all of those subtitles are generated manually by hand. Some of them are just translated from a different language using AI techniques. And all of this is enabled using AI. So it's everywhere, it's in both casual and critical applications. So the robustness is uh, definitely of concern to us. So uh, I spent some time on this slide, but it's an important one because it's uh, necessary to understand what are the different points at which uh, you know your deep learning system might get compromised and what are the different ways and uh, classifications. So 
So in terms of input, uh, what can happen is that the attacker uh, who wants to, for whatever reason, affect your deep learning system adversarially, can uh, embed the attack in the input itself. Uh, and there are two classes. It's either perceptible or imperceptible. In a perceptible uh, distortion, uh, you will be able to see that, okay, this image has been tampered with. But uh, there are also imperceptible input distortions. So you would see uh, you know, uh, that this input is perfectly fine, but your deep learning network behaves very oddly. And I'll show you some examples visually as well. Um, but the challenge is that uh, you know, all of these systems, they are present because you want to automate uh, the process. So whether it's perceptible or imperceptible, a human might not even you know, get to look at it because that's the point. You want to automate everything. So that's why it's dangerous. Then there can be targeted attacks versus non-targeted attacks. So a targeted attack is essentially um, when you have a particular image, and let's say that uh, you know you are doing, uh, let's say you are uh, you run an insurance company, right? And you want to see whether there is damage or no, no damage. So a targeted attack would be, you know, that I want this input to be like, you know, uh, a damage or no damage, particularly. A non-targeted attack would say that, okay, I don't care what it is, but I just want to make sure that it's not the right answer. So anything but the right answer is non-targeted, and this particular wrong answer is the targeted attack. Then image-specific versus universal, essentially for every image, you might have to compute what sort of distortion you want to add. And universal is essentially, this is one distortion for this network, and you add this distortion to any image, and it will certainly you know, not be classified correctly. In terms of uh, visibility of the network, there is black box and white box. So white box is essentially when you have access to the entire network, you can uh, take a look at what the inter uh, or essentially the hidden layer activations are, and you can uh, create an attack that would be very, very successful for that network. Uh, but that's not the very practical scenario. That's where the research in this area started from. But black box attacks are also possible. Technically, gray box, essentially, uh, a black box attack is where you do not have access to the network. But uh, what I say as gray box is that, okay, you do not have access to the network, but you can pass as many inputs as you want to the network and get back the output. This is this can be the case with many of these APIs and you know entry points where you can uh, just sort of see what the network gives when you give it a particular type of input. And there is research uh, that has been conducted which shows that you know, if you have access to only this level of information, even then you can attack the system by essentially creating a network that emulates this particular network that matches the output of this network perfectly, and then attacking that network which you created, and that attack translates very well to the target network for which you did not have access. And then finally, benign versus danger. This is more of an application level thing where, uh, uh, you know, of how much is the impact of the adversarial attack. So let's just go through all of these. Um, sorry, and just one of the classic examples, right? This was one of the initial papers in this uh, research area. And uh, the illustration essentially what it shows is that on the very left hand side, right, you have the panda image. And this panda image is classified correctly as a panda by the Alien classification neural network. Uh, and this is an image of a given. Now what you do is you take the class gradient, the entire class uh, average gradient for the given class. You add this gradient to the panda image with a very small weight. So you see that the appearance of the panda has not changed much at all, especially at this resolution and zoom levels. But this adversarial example is now classified as a given by the network. So suddenly your network has been fooled by just this noisy uh, gradient image. In fact, there are some internet memes about this as well. Uh, who will win a deep neural network uh, state of the art or you know, one noisy uh, image. So benign adversaries would be, uh, you know, low criticality applications. And uh, in the left hand side, you will see that, okay, this is the correctly classified image. This is school bus. This is, uh, you know, what it is and uh, some sort of temple uh, thing. Uh, and when you add the noise image uh, or the noise gradient to this, all of these are now classified as ostrich, right? So this is uh, like a targeted attack where you want everything to be classified as an ostrich and you compute a noise uh, that is relevant 
so that you know apply it to the image and you can see that the noise pattern does change because you have to add different kinds of noise to different images and you can make your uh, network classify all, all of them as ostrich and this is the case of a universal non targeted image uh, attack where everything is being classified as something else so this face powder is being classified as a chihuahua the joystick is being classified again as a dog <laughs> and the grill of the image is being classified as a jaybird so all of those things right uh, and this can take you, the performance of your algorithm which you tested on some benchmark data set and it gave you 90% accuracy you deploy it and suddenly <clears throat> you know the accuracy is nowhere uh, another example and this actually gives a lot of insight into uh, how deep neural networks are not really that deep in their understanding because uh, all of these images they are classified as the uh, label beneath it for example this particular image which just has a yellow background and black stripes right this is classified as a school bus by a state of the art neural network and uh, uh, the learning that we get from this by looking at this example is that somehow the network has learned that okay just having uh, a yellow background and black stripes is enough for something to be classified as a school bus and uh, it shows uh, it gives some insight into you know how dependent it is on the training data because all of the training data for this particular network it had come from uh, us uh, images and in the us all school buses have this uh, yellow and black stripe sort of pattern and in order to get the maximum performance or the minimum cost function right um, detecting this feature and classifying it as a school bus based on this feature alone was enough because nothing else that had did not have this label did not have this pattern as well so it said okay this much is enough uh, similarly for a dial telephone for a pinwheel right it has reduced it down boiled it down to very very simple features and it just has the state of our performance on a data set based on that but in the real world if you were to deploy this model in india right where the school buses necessary not do not necessarily have this sort of pattern it would fail and you know exactly why so uh, adversary attacks are also a very good tool to sort of you know get insight into the deep network and how to make them better and all those things uh now some examples of dangerous adversaries right so let's say that you are driving an automatically driven car and uh, you uh, have some sort of a stop sign on the road and somebody has added this uh, attack gradient as a printed image and it has he has put uh this image on top of this stop sign during the night time let's say now when this image is being filtered through the camera of the car to the uh, car's ai now it is being classified as yield uh, and so uh your car would not slow down automatically so that can try you know uh, lead to accidents because you are expecting the car to slow down and maybe it, you know it causes one second delay in you manually applying the brakes and that's all that matters so that can be a challenge uh in this particular image you can see that uh, how identity theft is possible using adversarial attacks so this uh, individual on the top he has uh, worn a, a glass a, a 3d glass and the pattern that's printed on the glass frame is essentially designed so that when a face recognition system that has been trained with this identity uh, this is an uh, actress i forgot the name but essentially this person will be recognized as this person even though there is no visual resemblance and in fact even the gender is different but just because of this glass frame so imagine um, there is some automated uh, you know filtering mechanism uh, based on face recognition based for entry to a secure area or something somebody could you know fake their identity and walk through because there is let's say nobody manually there to check it um so in these cases it can be uh, definitely dangerous and age flipping and uh, you know changing a cancer image to a normal image and so on um black box and white box i have already covered this so i'll uh, not spend more time here uh one of the very uh, popular questions or essentially hot topics right now in research is why do adversarial examples exist and uh, there are many theories there was a theory initially that uh, deep networks are uh, not non linear enough and that is why it exists uh, that has been uh, contested with uh, experimental results and then there was another theory that said that okay they are actually in fact too linear 
and even that has been contested but uh, this is a broad level theory which essentially um does not go into the mathematical details of why they exist but more like a philosophical model of why adversities exist and this is something um that i agree with as well and what essentially this theory means is uh, you know local generalization versus extreme generalization so as humans what we do um via abstraction and reasoning is the case on the right where we have seen only these data points and there are various gaps in our understanding but we understand that okay you know all of these data points are bound together by this common thread for example uh, one example that i like to use is chairs so as long as you understand that okay a chair is meant to be sit on and it has some support to you know keep it upright even if you see a designer chair or a very you know concept uh, design and all of those fancy modern chairs you would still be able to see that okay it has you know uh, some area that where you could sit on it has uh, a form factor that fits that of a chair and you can say that okay this might be a chair this is a very weird chair you might take a few seconds to realize it but you can say that okay yeah this is a chair on the other hand a neural network has seen the samples and it creates some decision boundaries right so all of these shaded areas are decision boundaries for the network so it has seen three samples here so it has done some level of generalization some local generalization but these points were very far away from this visually or in the feature space of the network so it has created these separate decision boundaries any point that lies in this region right this is a blind spot for the neural network because it has not seen enough samples for it to you know uh, believe so a neural network knows only what it sees essentially and it does not know what to do with anything that lies in this region so even if some point lies right here it's very close to this point but it's just in a blind spot and essentially by exploiting these blind spots that's how the adversaries are created uh this is a rough example uh, uh, illustration of uh, how adversaries work so this is the original ostrich image let's say it lies somewhere in here right and this area that is uh, surrounded by all sides and decision boundary 1 decision boundary 2 decision boundary 3 these are essentially boundaries for different classes it lies somewhere here you add a particular distortion delta and the image suddenly goes from this right over here so it's still very close to this image but now it has gone into the area of decision boundary 1 and now it's an adversarial example because now the neural network sees that okay this is a edge case for this, this particular class so this is basically the um, like computing this delta while keeping it you know as a minimum distortion to the image is the guiding principle behind all of the uh, visually imperceptible attacks and there are various there is uh, deep fool there is universal adversarial perturbation uh there are references at the end of the slides and uh, you can go and read these papers it's uh, difficult to cover any of them in much detail in the scope of this talk but it will be interesting for you to see but essentially even though all of these different attacks some of them use l2 distance some of them use l1 distance or some different tricks right but the overall principle is the same that you minimize the change in the visual domain so that it remains in, imperceptible to the user but when you have access to the feature space of the deep neural network that is the space where it projects the input in order to do the classification that's where you want it to deviate the most uh this is just a flow of you know where we are going wrong so in the real world we have embodied human experience we create abstract concepts uh, like i gave the chair example using this abstract concept we create the label data because most of the label data is essentially labeled by human by us and then we train a machine learning model the machine learning model does match the label data or you know the training data that we have given the test data that's how you get like performance of 99% in fact there was a paper that claimed 100% face recognition performance by machine but that's all of that is just on this label data it does not match the human mental model that it came from so the level of understanding we want does not match and it does not may not always translate well to the real world in very constrained scenarios in ideal scenarios it might work but in the presence of anything like an adversarial attack it fails so uh, my uh, people uh, it's uh, primary it primarily deals with face recognition and face recognition is also everywhere uh, nowadays it 
CCTV surveillance, these are more critical applications than forensic application are also there. And then a matching of sketches to digital uh, face images, actual face images. Uh, but it also exists in casual applications, your auto tagging, uh, suggested tags, uh, right? And um, some of these photo managers, they create automatic albums based on person and all of those things. So face recognition is just, you know, very well uh, illustrated very well in this image. So you detect a face. So okay, there are four faces in this image, and then you recognize okay, this is uh, Mary, this is Pedro, this is, and then it also can do certain stuff like okay, what is the access level of this person? He, she is a staff member. This is a contractor. It, all of that is uh, face recognition. Um, so who are these celebrities? If you look at these images and just wonder for a while, uh, you might think that okay, this is some celebrity that I don't know. Whereas in reality. All three of them are fake. Uh, these are celebrity images that are created by a neural network. Uh, the paper is this one, Progressive Growing of GANs, uh, Generative Adversarial Networks for Improved Quality Stability and Variations. It was published in ICLR 2018. And essentially what this paper shows is that by training itself on a large database of celebrity images, it can now generate fake identities uh, and fake images that look like celebrity images because you know the lighting and the pose and the appearance this is all of the in fact in this case it has even generated the background of some sort of marketing book uh, where essentially the celebrities will promote something and get photoshopped right um, so the overview of the next section so how do face recognition systems handle adversarial face images are they affected or not what is the impact and then defenses, how does one detect adversarial images? And the other aspect is how do you mitigate once the adversarial image is detected? What it means is that, okay, I know that this particular image has been adversarially attacked, but what can I do about it? Can I still use this image and not give the wrong result? Can I still perform my, uh, my recognition pipeline effectively? So, <clears throat> This is uh, an example, and this is, these are real values here. So VGG uh, is the network that was proposed by the Oxford lab, and it performed really well on faces. Open face is uh, an implementation of FaceNet. So these are like two state-of-the-art uh, face neural networks. And uh, let's see how they behave in presence of an adversarial attack. And this particular attack is uh, coming under the perceptible category. So if you were to manually inspect, you would see that, okay, something is wrong here. But uh, if it goes through an automated pipeline, then nobody is there to check it, right? And uh, what happens is, uh, okay, th these are two images of the same uh, individual. And uh, when they are not adversarially perturbed, VGG gives a distance uh, score of 0 0.23. Open phase gives a distance score of 0 0.2. And it's a genuine pair because it lies below the threshold. But attacker created a false reject by adding just these five, six, nine. And suddenly the distance score of VGG becomes 0 0.7, distance score of open phase becomes 2.4. So the distance score for VGG is normalized between 0 to 1. Uh, the score for open phase goes up to 0 uh, 2.6, 2.7. So suddenly your network would start to classify it as an imposter pair or essentially that, okay, this image and this image are two different individuals. Similarly, there are other cases you can create a false accept. Uh, so the network would say that, okay, these two are the same image and so on. So um, this is kind of like the pipeline that we propose. So given a face image, or it can also translate to any object image, right? Uh, it goes into a deep neural network. You do the uh, network activation analysis. Uh, based on that, you try to detect an attack. If you do detect an attack, then you perform whatever attack mitigation you want to perform. And if not, then you directly go to matching. Uh, these are uh, essentially some of the visible distortions we proposed. And the advantage in terms of attacking the network of these distortions is that you don't need to uh, you know, optimize the error function or anything like that. This is just static, face-specific uh, distortions where uh, essentially these can be applied to any object, but these are like, uh, occluding the eyebrow and uh, forehead region, occluding the eyes, and creating like sort of a fake beard. And uh, G and H, uh, these rows, you won't be able to see much of a difference because these are essentially visually imp uh, imperceptible distortions, open face and default. Um, so 
before going to summary let me just uh, go into the existing detection methods and i'll spend some time here uh, so that you can get a view of what are the different approaches that have been tried in uh, in existing literature so there is safety net uh, what safety net does in essence is it learns the uh, svm on different patterns of the late stage uh, relu activation so relu is a type of layer in a cnn and uh, what they do is that they train with adversarial samples and non adversarial samples and try to see what uh, pattern exists in late stage relu layer late stage means it's you know just few layers before the final output and uh, they train a scm classifier on that and uh, they try to detect attacks using that there is uh, another approach which works for detector sub network and essentially what it does is it adds layers to the original network and uh, those layers are specifically meant to detect adversarial attacks and again the network is trained with adversarial and non adversarial attacks and you do that sort of two class classification there then is the exploiting convolution filter statistics which is very uh, close but still uh, a little different from what we have proposed and uh, they just do a cascade of classifiers applied on uh, convolution filter statistics such as median and other things and second level third level statistics uh, additional class augmentation so essentially usually your output layer would contain as many nodes as there are classes let's say you have 200 classes this would add one more node 201 and essentially that node would get fired up whenever uh, you detect an adversarial attack and then of course you have to train the network in that way then there is feature squeezing so you have one very deep network and a second squeezing network which does not have that many parameters and you just compare the output of the two networks uh, there is magnet uh, where essentially you take all of the clean images that you know are clean and you try to learn um, the behavior of all of these clean images and you create a manifold and whenever you get an input image you compare you know the distance of this clean image or this input image from the manifold of clean images if it lies too far away then you say that okay this is the det uh, detected as an adversarial attack then you have denoising so you do uh, a smoothing sort of filter on top of it so usually in computer vision if we have a noisy image then we would apply some sort of blur in order to reduce the impact of the noise so this is basically what they are doing and the idea is that uh, since the distortions are very uh, minute uh, this would essentially get rid of uh, this uh, distortion and give you the uh, correct output and then uncertainty estimate so uh, what level of certainty the network has the confidence that the network has if it's low for it is been rejected as an adversarial attack so the summary now so the summary is essentially you either modify the training method or modify the input uh, you can add layers you can change the activation function loss function you can use external models you can do some image pre level uh, level pre processing or you can use intermediate layers activation and statistics uh our method we do not use any external add on model or deep learning model uh we do not care which loss function is used and uh, we work without modifying the existing training method and method and the motivation behind the proposed approach essentially is this one and you can see so it's in, in the case of grids and beard distortions right so you can see the zoomed output so these are the um, filter outputs at one of the convolution layers and you can see zoomed output so some of the convolution layers are affected more by the distortion uh, so if i were to use these for face recognition these do not actually contain any face information instead what they have done is they have reacted very sensitively to the edge information present in this uh, distortion right and uh, if i use these for recognition then of course my recognition output is going to be uh, incorrect so what we do is uh, we take the original input and adversarial input we take the deep neural network and we just analyze so we do not modify anything in the network we just see how it's behaving in both cases and we uh, train a svm on the layer wise difference between the uh, mean of the clean images versus the uh, changes that happen when the adversarial version of the same image is put there and uh, our feature vector length for this svm is essentially equal to the number of layers so at every layer we have uh, all of these nodes and we just sum the difference between all of these nodes and we can uh, use that as a feature so 
so whenever so we learn this mean and uh, the differences uh, and whenever a new image comes in we can compare and essentially pass that distance vector to the sfm it can tell us whether it's an adversarial type or not uh, and this is essentially some of the results for adversarial detection uh, the uncertainty approach and adaptive noise reduction is an even newer one, uh, which we have compared it, uh, which we have compared the proposed approach to. So uh, you can see, so in this one, we have compared it with a phase quality based metric because sometimes they would say that, okay, for visible distortions, you could just do a quality check. And if the quality is low, then you could do that. Uh, but we observe that on two databases, so point and shoot and uh, med. Uh, these are one of two benchmark data sets in uh, face recognition. And we have used uh, B-key and SSEQ. These are generic no reference quality measures. Face quality is uh, face specific quality measures. But we see that um, the performance of these ranges anywhere from you know, 60 to 64% for beard, 63, 67% for, beard, 63, 67% for uh, MSB. This is a noise based uh, distortion. Whereas the proposed approach can do much better. So light scene and VGG are both proposed approach results. And then applied to the light CNN network and VGG network. And uh, this particular uh, uh, figure will also show you that uh, compared to adaptive noise and vision and uncertainty, this can perform better. But you can see that in the case of imperceptible distortion, uh, the performance of even the proposed approach is roughly 50. And these are even below 50. So it's very difficult to detect some of these attacks. Uh, and I would say that that is. Uh, something or uh, somewhat of a concern in case of universal attack you can see that okay uh, some something close to 90 percent something more than 80 percent uh, at least this approach can do but uh, it's it's not perfect right and much more work needs to be done um there is some prior work on mitigation as well essentially trying to perform accurate uh, recognition even in the presence of uh, adversarial attack and there are various approaches for this as well um so generative adversarial networks, these are popular GAN-based defense. So let me just start here. And uh, a GAN is a method of training a network where you have one generative network and one adversarial network. And the adversarial network continuously keeps trying to defeat or essentially fool the generative network. And the generative network will try to generate uh, representations that are more uh, you know, in tune with uh, what the final output should be. So that's how it sort of, in a game theory sort of way, both of the networks compete against each other and uh, that's how you uh, can train a network that can you know, uh, be uh, safe from these sort of attacks. <clears throat> then there is uh, adding some pre-input layers to do some sort of pre-processing using a deep network. Uh, then there is uh, biologically inspired protection using highly non-linear activation functions. So you do not uh, use sigmoid or uh, hyperbolic tan, you just use more nonlinear functions. Then there is defensive distillation. So you take the class probability vectors uh, where essentially each node gives you the probability that okay, this image is of this class. And using those probability vectors, you retrain the original model and uh, you make sure that, okay, these, the difference of these probabilities for the correct answer, the probability of the uh, correct class is boosted even further. So that even in the presence of adversarial attack, uh, the difference cannot be reduced so easily. Then gradient regularization, uh, possible networks, deep cloak, uh, uh, right? All of these work with changing the training. Uh, in this case, you are adding a layer-wise regularization. Uh, in this case, you are uh, regularizing the difference in output. So essentially, what it means is that you do not uh, let small changes in the input cause large changes in the output by design. Um, here you are adding a mask layer and um, that mask layer will tell you whether this is an adversarial sample or not and based on which one you take a different pathway through the network. So summary of uh, all of these uh, mitigation approaches, right? So you need a modified training method. So either you have to retrain your network with this method or some modified inputs. Uh, you can add more layers, etc. You can again use external models. But we try to uh, do it without modifying the existing training method on network. So after you have trained, you already have a trained network, you can still apply a mitigation approach. So uh, 
the idea again is to assess the intermediate activation and uh, in this particular case in the detection case we just wanted to look at the difference and we just did a very broad level analysis okay if there is this much difference from the mean of clean images then we detect an attack in this case we do a layer wise filter wise uh, score and this score essentially tells us that which filters and uh, which layers are most affected by the cellular attacks and what we do is at uh, test time we remove a certain percentage so these are parameters of the network and uh, we remove a certain percentage of these nodes and then just perform recognition without the help of these nodes and what we observed is that if we are able to detect the attack uh, reliably uh, with 70% 80% accuracy and then apply this method only on the adversarial attack and not on all the clean images as well then removing the um, removing part of the networks um, features is actually better than using those features for recognition so it's better off like they are better off without uh, using those features um and these are the mitigation results uh, genuine accept rate essentially refers to how many times you are able to uh, you know make not make uh, false rejects and at 1% false accept rate so this is the general way of how these things systems are evaluated so while keeping the false accept rate at 1% how high can you take the genuine accept rate so in the case of uh, when the proposed uh, mitigation approach is applied to light thin and vgg phase uh, the original performance uh, of this network on point and shoot is 60.5 after distortions it drops down to roughly 26% and after applying the mitigation approach we are able to get back up to 36% performance uh, so of course 36 is nowhere close to 60.5 but it's uh, definitely around a 10% improvement from 36 so uh, you can get back some of the performance but as you can see even in this case 54 uh, down to 14.6 and up to 24.8 so 9 to 10% performance improvement in uh, the best case right uh this is essentially again the roc verification rate is the same as gar uh the original performance is this solid black line and everything else is just as trying to you know mitigate the effects of uh, the adversary attack so we are very far away from the ideal uh, or the original performance so a lot of work still needs to be done and uh Yes. So conclusions. Uh, the conclusions and the takeaways are that we must keep in mind that even if uh, on a state-of-art uh, uh, network we get you know good performance on the benchmark data set, they are still susceptible to adversarial attacks. So the real-world performance might not match, and one of the reasons might be this one. And uh, it has long been claimed that okay, deep networks emulate the human mind, but they are far away from it. The understanding level that they have is not that uh, deep at all. uh so they do not behave like the human mind we should not uh, compare them directly and much more work needs to be done uh, in order to do that and they may be in imperceptible or perceptible attacks so not every attack will be visible uh, visually uh, but it does not mean that the image is necessarily clean so that has to be kept in mind as well and uh, there exist some measures uh, to detect and mitigate some defenses but there are limitations to each of those defenses um, and even in the proposed approach you see that the performance still gives a lot of scope for improvement so this is still an ongoing process but if you are deploying a deep network now you might want to look into some of these uh, approaches that exist and see which one fits your use case best if you can tease the training method then do that at least you'll have some level of robustness and there are several open source toolboxes that are now available and using those two boxes you can get a metric of okay how susceptible is my network to these adversarial attacks and uh, you know uh, you can even run your network through certain level of uh, adversarial attacks using these two boxes so if you just search adversarial attack tool box you will find uh, many github repositories where you can actually try out some of the adversarial attacks and uh, you know try to even contribute to the body of research and uh, this is where i would stop for uh, q and a some reference slides follow so if the deck is shared then uh, you can go through all of the references and explore any particular paper or algorithm in more detail okay, gaurav can you hear us yeah i can hear you now okay so uh, gaurav uh, we have uh, actually i have a question okay 
uh, does this attacks involve uh, disrupting ai model during the training stage or can they be impacted later as well they can be in, impacted later as well in fact uh, uh, impact during the training stage itself is uh, so we consider that okay we can somehow prevent that and even when we reduce remove that possibility entirely even then all of this body of research exists on how we can attack and how we need to defend so if you impact it at the training level itself then um that's an entirely different ball game right? it's going because to then before it starts i think <laughs> sorry so if the attack is in the in the training stage itself uh, then the ai system is going to fail even before yeah uh, even before deployment then even after deployment how you can make them fail yeah and yeah and i uh, come from a, a satellite background okay where okay. we do uh, i used to do image processing uh, of satellites uh, satellite images okay and i used to work on how to correct them so uh, now this attack actually uh, makes me rethink about uh, my studies so i think this is going to even uh, change the way a satellite is going to pick up if an ai model is involved right uh and yeah actually this is going to change the whole uh, uh, game of uh, face recognition or other image recognition right if uh, some uh, such a thing happens right so uh, gara one more qu one question i have uh, shalaka here mm -hmm. uh, see, all the, uh, the the defense that you talked about right it basically says uh basically to figure out a comparison between how your neural network is going to behave uh, on a correct image versus a distorted image correct uh, and basically work at the difference now uh, so the basic presumption under this is we pretty much know what all distortion can be there in the existing correct image uh, and this is to me this looks like a catch up game right i mean somebody will come up with a distortion which you have not thought through and hence uh, may be liable to attack again so what are your thoughts on this yes that is uh, one of the potential limitations but what we have done uh, for our approach is that we have trained it on only a subset of distortions so let's say that there are seven distortions that we considered we train it on uh, four or five of them and then we test it on the others and we see that the performance translates well but the catch here is that the performance was you know close to 70% to begin with so 30% of the cases you are not able to detect so while this 70% or 65% 70% level of performance can be translated even to unseen distortion is it enough no so this is definitely a limitation that exists in pretty much all of the uh, approaches that work on changing the training method right because uh, they also rely on uh adding adversarial samples so the ideal case of okay unseen distortion unseen network and then you are able to defend uh that does not exist yet uh the research community is uh trying to come up with new defense mechanisms but uh what i have observed is i did a literature review again uh, this february itself and uh, there are four or five new papers that came up with uh, new defense mechanisms and said that okay this can beat everything and then again as you said right it's a cat and mouse game uh, because more papers have come up which have refuted each one of those five attacks uh, five defenses by proposing different methods of attacks and they're able to bypass those defenses so right now it's going into that mode what we need is a more universal solution um, maybe do not think about defense maybe just change the way we are doing deep uh, deep learning itself because uh one very fundamental issue uh is the local generalization versus extreme generalization that i talked about and the uh, reason behind that is that you know at the end of the day deep learning network is just a bunch of uh, weight into input plus bias uh through some nonlinear plus you know all of those things so not everything can be represented in this simple format so that's a fundamental issue over deep learning as a whole so it will take some time to get an answer to that i guess okay okay all right so hopefully we figure out uh, ways to sort of get ahead of the mm, game in the near future gaura thank you very much for your time it was really an exciting session with full of deep insights
uh, i'm sure the tech athena community will really appreciate uh, uh, the efforts that you have put into you know really make us understand about what's happening uh, in this field thank you very much and thank please you. Thank you. yeah please do subscribe to our channel uh, you can always reach us uh, in our meetup uh, uh, page or you can uh, leave your questions in the youtube channel under the session uh, chat or you can directly uh, mail us uh, on techathena at gmail.com uh, reach us out if you have any questions and uh, there's a replay which will be available and also please do subscribe on our youtube channel this will help you uh, attend all the future uh, sessions which are going to come up because when the when we go live you will get a notification uh, if you subscribe so and thank you thank you for your time today and thanks gaurav thank you everyone yeah thank you and